All right, good morning. We are here to talk about math online. My name is Bob Nash. I'm the Dean of Academic Affairs at the California Virtual Campus Online Education Initiative. And as you may know, uh, we run a little website called cvc.edu, which among other things has an app called fin uh, Finish Faster Online, where students who can't find a course at their home college will go to find it online at another college. And one of the highest demand courses they're looking for is math online, especially math that satisfies the CSU or UCGE requirements. Uh, so that's what we're here to talk about today. There is a scarcity of those courses, and that is because there are challenges to math that aren't uh, owned by other disciplines that our experts will talk about today. If we can offer more of these courses online, it stands to reason will help students complete and will help them to complete more quickly which is part of our mission at CVC OEI. So if you would, take a look at cvc.edu uh, where you'll find uh, that resource that your students are now using. I'll just quickly introduce the panelists and then I'll offer some background information. Then each of them will have five minutes to speak. Then we'll open it up to Q&A. We have Victoria Dominguez from Citrus College. Mike Padilla is from Butte College. Sarah Williams from Foothill. And Fred Feldman from Coastline College all very deep in the online space. All right, here's some background that'll help you digest this conversation. First of all, about two years ago, you may recall the chancellor of the CSU system confirmed for us that they will accept all courses for GE uh, requirements that in any modality, on-site, hybrid, or online. Okay, we're good there. Uh, you can get this presentation at the OTC website and click on these links for uh, the original documents. Also to help guide you in this it are the CID descriptors. This is uh, part of the transfer model curriculum, uh, the people who bring you the ADT structures. And there are CID descriptors for several math courses now, among them being Math 110 Statistics. If you go there, you see what kind of looks like a course outline. It also describes some of the activities that one would expect in such a class, whether on-site or online, but um, of course we're talking about online here. Also, guiding notes for GE, those reviewers get guiding notes and they have a space for those that satisfy CSU and UC uh, quantitative uh, requirements. So I encourage you to look there. Again, there, there's no modality uh, limitations, so we're, we're free to each, college is free to do what it wishes in this area um, as long as they go through their normal curriculum process and add that important DE addendum to that. All right, please consider this. Uh, we do have some unique challenges in math. How do you conduct discussions in math? Effective practices that generally uh, we want to give those who practice automatic or very quick feedback on what they're doing for best learning. Uh, we tend to have high stakes exams, so proctoring becomes an issue, and the cost and accessibility of homework packages is a, a factor here that uh, all four will consider. Keep in mind the UCs and CSUs will accept these courses online. That may or may not be true for the private uh, universities and those out of state, so keep in touch with your con counselors on that. They'll know where the barriers are. And finally, this is the beginning of our conversation about math online. We are creating a space uh, for a community of practice in our CVC instance of Canvas, and we're going to ask that you all send us your names and email addresses. Ah, and thank you, Logan. Logan will pass around a portfolio where you can write your name and email address, and we'll put you in this uh, portal to continue this conversation if you'd like to be uh, sharing and, and sharing your, your practices if you teach online or asking questions of our experts. All right. Do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you'll, you'll participate? Good, that's my first thing. I haven't asked these folks yet, but I, I, hope, I hope they will participate can, and lead the discussion. To the effectiveness of social media groups, uh, Facebook groups, portals, listservs, yeah. uh, how effective they can be. And you, if, it, if it works, you may see posts every day from somebody with lengthy discussions and comments and just golden nuggets every day. One reason I asked Fred is like he's the king of peer-to-peer -peer sharing online, <laughs> so perfect. 
All right, uh, we'll start with Victoria. Uh, you have five minutes. All Give right. us uh, just some summary of nuggets of wisdom, Absolutely. and then we'll move on. So thank you for being here today, everybody, and I'm very happy to share my experience teaching online. Uh, one thing about the community of practice, I wanted to mention that Citrus College, where I'm from, has been um, implementing our AB 705 co-requisite classes, and the thing that's making them succeed is a community of practice. Mm -hmm. It's not an online community of practice, but it's you know where the faculty meet together to talk about issues. So I applaud having this online community of practice. I think it's the best way for us to share. I teach, um, right now, two different classes online, our introductory statistics and also our calculus for business and social sciences. So it's our applied calculus. I did teach our pre-statistics pre in the past. Haven't taught it again because of AB 705. We're not offering as many of those anymore. Um, one th I want to address the first point on the slide, which is best practices using discussion forums. I used to give like really convoluted discussion posts for my stats classes online and I just felt like they were so, f they weren't very helpful. I felt like I had st asked students to find ways that normal distributions in your life or in, in the world. It's like, it's not so good. <laughs> it didn't work good. It just didn't work too well. There's a podcast that I listen to called Teaching in Higher Ed. Do any of you listen to it? Yes, so a couple of you, that's good. I hope more of you will find it. It's Bonnie Stahoviak is the, uh, the author or the, she's the moderator of this. She had a, a person, and I don't remember the name of this person, but she had a math faculty be her guest one podcast that I was listening to. And that, that math faculty talked about how they use Twitter for getting st online students to connect. And I'm driving and I'm thinking to myself, well, that's good. I don't know if I want to use Twitter, though. And then, bam, use discussion boards. So what I do in my discussion boards is I have, for every module, I have students post four homework problems why they're having trouble with them. They also have to, they generally have to post like a picture or a screenshot of the problem so that students can see the section and the problem number. And then they have to reply to two of their classmates and provide them help. So it makes an amazing community in this class. Week after week, they're helping each other, they're reaching out to each other, and I'm very, very pleased with the amount of participation and the access to this discussion board. It's so much more than my convoluted past with it. So I'm very, I'm happy with it. And if any of you would like to come on up after, we're, after this is over and I can give you my email, I'd be happy to share. I, have, I can send you a PDF I made of a sample one so you can see what it looks like. Or you can up upload that to the community. I will upload it to the community. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I use three different homework systems in my online classes. I want to talk about the best one, I think, which is my open math. And they're all integrated into Canvas. So I don't want students to go out of Canvas and leave Canvas. I want them to stay there and do everything in Canvas. My Open Math actually is the easiest system to integrate into Canvas. It's also the easiest one for students to enroll in because they don't have to pay for it. The moment they access the first My Open Math homework, they're connected. The system sets up a, a, their account in My Open Math. They don't have to do anything. So it's been very smooth. The thing I also like about my open math is I can customize it. Now, to be honest, it's not as pretty as the other ones I'm going to mention. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but you can add some of those bells and whistles. You can add videos, for example, to individual homework problems. It really helps the students to see a similar problem so that they can get help with it. You can also add the ability for them to ask you a question just like the Ask My Instructor in my math lab. You can add those. And I think um, um, Michael will tell you more about how to customize my open math. So you'll hear more in a second. I also use my math lab or my stat lab, depending on what class I'm teaching. Oh, the last thing I wanted to mention about my open math is it's very accessible. I had a, a blind student this semester in my 
stats with support, and I used my open math, and he had no problem at all doing the homework with his um, JAWS screen reader. Very good. I do question the accessibility of my open math, I'm sorry, of my math lab and my stat lab, as well as WebAssign, I'm gonna mention next, because I found, as I've been using, they're the ones I've been using the longest, but they're, they haven't been very clear on if they're ac completely accessible. So that's a big issue to me, as is the, the cost. You know, pretty expensive, over $100 for a student to use these systems. For my class this summer, it's still 104.95. They told me the fall will be 70, 69.95. I asked the, the, oh, f am I done? <laughs> I'll wrap yeah. it up. Fred, Fred can fill in the blanks on those. All right, thank you. Um, I like, although it's a tedious setup with my math lab, I do like that it's easy to update. Their auto sync is great. The test student in Canvas, you get the full experience. You see what the student sees. Versus WebAssign, which I don't like very much. I feel it's the most complicated setup. I feel also, I'm frustrated, and I found this out by mistake, that um, for to create multiple ver um, attempts at exams, you have to actually create two or three exams in WebAssign, and then give each one 90 minutes or however long you make your your exam for the student. That is part. Okay, so expensive. So my experiences, I'm really looking into my open math, and I hope you will too. Thank you. Okay, Michael, take it away. Hi, everybody. So I teach uh, predominantly stats at Butte College, specifically with AB 705 now coming in effect. That's the only class that I'll probably teach that I see myself teaching at Butte College. Um, I'm going to talk about Proctorio, uh, the, the program that films students for proctoring, uh, backwards design, uh, picking themes for a course and, and making every assessment kind of based on those themes. And then also I'm going to talk about my open math and um, talk more about what Victoria, uh, what she likes about the program and also creating your own um, problems and assessments to match your language throughout the course. So I had a student a couple weeks ago come and see me to check out a calculator, and she brought her three kids, and she said she's having child care issues, housing issues, and transportation issues, and her house burned down in the campfire. So she's working on, she told me she was gonna work on problems one at a time. One problem would then take five minutes off because she had stuff to do. And then at night, she was gonna do her quizzes and exams. So the last thing that I wanna do is provide another barrier for that student and force her to come on campus to figure out how to figure out all those different things, all those challenges to figure out a way to take a proctored exam when I have proctorio um, that I could use. So that was my real big motivation to find a way to make proctorio to work. That it's not perfect, but it's a work in progress and I think it depends on how we approach it as teachers to make it work best. So does everybody in here know what proctorio is? Yeah, anybody not? Maybe that's a better question. All right, proctorio film students, it's an attachment within Canvas. It, it does eye recognition and things like that. I think the most important thing is just the, the, that it'll check your ID before the exam and just verify that that it is the student and make sure nobody else is in the exam room with them. Um, there are some holes in it and I'll talk about that in a second. So just some good points with Proctorio that I've learned is to have a really lenient late policy that tech issues always happen at 10 o'clock at night uh, when the assignments do. And also to do practice Proctorio. So, I give quizzes that totally do not need to be proctored in any way, but it kind of gets the student used to um, getting filmed while I'm working these math problems. Because I think if they go in and take an exam, and that's the first time they're using this, it's like, well, what happens when I type the numbers in? Is the computer gonna explode, right? Or something like that, that there's some <laughs> comfort level with the students and with the program, that we don't want them going into, like taking an exam is stressful. Getting filmed is stressful, and putting those two together, I think is a, a tough route. So. Also, if you do quizzes, it gives you a chance to kind of understand how the program works and adjustments you can make. So also with Proctory, I'll say this on, on my campus, we have a, a department policy that our exams are 70% proctored without notes. So we kind of have to find a way to make this work that I can't replace those exams with projects or something like that. It has to be a proctored exam. So, um, with really wanting Proctorio to work, I had to think about what my high stakes assessments were gonna look like. 
um, that I couldn't just do numerical answers for those, right? Because there's concern of cheating or, or anything else, having notes or anything like that. So I went through backwards design, did some reading on it, and I picked two themes for my stats course. Those were law of large numbers and significance, that everything was going to focus on that and trickle down. So when I went to write my assessment, I decided to make them all um, essay response. Okay, so they're all essay response. I asked the students to tell me their process, why they're choosing that process, the answer, their work, and interpret the results. So it's this kind of critical thinking approach to the problem as opposed to plugging in numbers, running through, and getting an answer. Um, and then from there, it became pretty easy, once I had that set, to write quizzes to represent that in lecture. The sore thumb was the homework system um, because the problems weren't mine in that homework system. And I just want to say this quick story because I always kind of chuckle is that when I first started teaching, uh, or I was talking with our TMI guy designing the course, and he, I told him I wanted to use Pearson. And he said, how much is that? And I said, 100 bucks. And he was like so upset with me right, to use Pearson. He knew how much it cost, but he was just trying to make a point. And it worked. So I looked into my open math, and it was just this wonderful program. It had, for me, for the, for the extent that I use an online math, an online homework problem, it had all the bells and whistles that I needed. Um, as Victoria was talking about with the um, Ask Instructor and all of those tabs and attaching videos. So I found problems, and they were pretty good. They were like 80% good. Right? And I attached videos for that other 20% saying, like, this is what the problem's asking you. That was kind of annoying in the fact that, like, my lecture was, was focused, my quizzes were focused, my exams were focused, but my homework was only kind of focused. So I decided to dive in and write my own problems. And that was like, a, I'm not a coder, like, I don't have a programming background. And remember, the first problem took me, like, an hour to write, right? But the second one took a minute to write, right? That once you get that first one, they just flow. And last semester, I was able to write the whole course, um, whole course worth of problems. So it's like this consistent language all the way throughout the course. And it's totally free. And it's not dictated by a textbook. It's dictated by what I value in the class and what my voice is saying. So the students have a consistent voice. Another side note thing, it, it gives you the ability on MyOpenMath that you can focus your lectures on foundational topics. And then when you do a problem, if you want to throw a little curveball in there, then you can attach a video with a hint or something like that, and it's just in time for the student. They don't have to go search for how to do that. It's right there for them to get through. And I feel like since doing that, and it's just a work in progress, and it just keeps getting better and better and better, which you can do with my open math, and I don't know, or I don't really believe that you can do that with the other programs. That's five minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Before we, yes. Thank you, Michael. Before we move to Sarah, there are seats up in front if anybody standing wishes to sit there. Come on down. Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Williams. I teach math at Foothill College. Online, I've been teaching Calculus 1 and Calculus 2. Um, and we have lingering intermediate algebra um, that I teach online as well. I've been doing that uh, about three to five years. And through a lot of um, learning on my part, my success rates have gotten up to where my face-to-face -face success rates are. So I consider it. Uh, always a work in progress, but also um, successful. And at the same time, I'm in a, a large department at Foothill. We have about 17 full-time faculty. Um, so it's a, there's a wide range of attitudes um, in, towards everything, and in particular towards online learning. Um, so we don't have our full complement of classes online. We run a lot of online statistics. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about kind of my department's feelings towards Proctorio is something I'll spend some time on. Um, first, I'll just mention I'm a um, MyOpenMath user as well. I'm inspired by Mike here to dig into there and spend that first hour because I haven't done that. I've just done plug and play so far. And so um, if, you, if you're really committed to never coding your own problems, you can use MyOpenMath as well. That's what I've been doing. Um, and I've been doing it um, just for practice problems, so to give students that flexibility if they want more practice or if they don't want more practice. I think it's a great thing to throw in there. Um, I use the OER textbook as well in my calculus classes. I use Active Calculus, um, which is quite a conceptual 
um, textbook. The authors have put accompanying videos up on YouTube. Um, and I've been happy with that. I also use something called Apex Calculus, which is much more concise and kind of exercise driven. Um, so a lot of times the students want to want to point to something a little less conceptual as well. But I've used the whole range of textbook options in these classes. I still do use the Pearson product with the My Math Lab um, in intermediate algebra, but I really um, want to take the opportunities to push towards OER. The experience that I've had is when we had some equity money on campus to have those Pearson bundles to give to students. I still had students in my class that I could not give those to. It's just such a barrier to entry that when that two week free access expires or students who never get logged in in the first place, it's just really the opposite of what we're all talking about, welcoming the students at the door. I want my class, the students, if they can log into Canvas, which the school is making pretty easy for them now, everything's there in front of them, embedded in Canvas, as Victoria said, so I really, like that my active calculus pages are right there in, cal in, in Canvas, um, as well as the practice problems. Um, uh, during the q and A, I'm happy to address about NetTutor, Bob had asked me about. Um, or any online proctoring you guys use. W so NetTutor is the online tutoring that okay. we have the contract with. Um, and, and kind of I can tell a little bit before and after. If you're trying that and not having good success with that, that's where I was a couple years ago. And I've, I've turned that around a little bit. But I do want to talk about um, the final exams with the proctoring, uh, partly because I have some questions. Um, so our course outlines of record, as it turns out, indicate proctored final exams. Um, and, and so our department feels like this is an articulation issue, not just an internal policy issue. And we've taken that proctored to mean human proctoring because, of course, when those policies were written, Proctorio wasn't out there. So we've been looking at Proctorio over, over the last several years and just haven't felt like it does what we need it to do. So I appreciate Mike saying that it is on the instructor to use it for what it is and make it work. Um, so distance students who are more than 50 miles from our campus um, have to arrange proctoring at a location, at a college testing center. We have uh, an email address, a helpline, where those students can reach out and get advice about what's in my area from a Foothill employee, and also Foothill reimburses the cost of that. Um, so that's how we handle that. Um, but um, we are not comfortable with Proctorio because cheating is a feature in both our face-to-face -face classes and our online classes. Um, we are probably used to doing the um, computational problems, different from what Mike described, the essay problems. Um, and on the other hand, we're feeling pressure that it does limit access to our classes to require students to come to campus. Okay. Yeah. Five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sarah. On to Fred. Uh, I'm so happy my peeps are here. <laughs> As I listen to all the other sessions that I've attended, we just have so many unique problems, mostly because of our notation. So I want to make sure that this session addresses that issue. Nobody's talked about it so far. The instructional material can vary. Your testing procedures can vary, but we've got to make learning social. We have to teach students how to communicate mathematically. We have to teach students to learn how to learn, and we just have a terrible disadvantage with our notation because of the difficulty of typing math on a keyboard. So I want to make sure we talk about how you do that. How do you get students in your online classes, in your discussion boards, or in your meetings and webinars to communicate mathematically. The other barrier is the new state law that eliminates or discourages remedial classes. We're getting tons of underprepared students in our college level courses and this fall it's really going to hit home as many of us eliminate these or reduce the number of these remedial classes. I started this last spring teaching college algebra. Another professor taught statistics 
both for underprepared students who have not taken the prerequisite. Statistics was fine, so I think in the SLAM, the statistics and liberal arts math pathway, you're gonna be okay. Uh, Professor Lee is having about a 75% success rate, which is, a, you know, which is close to what we all get in our regular, uh, our regular college classes. I, on the other hand, with college algebra, man, I'm having a terrible time. I started with 21 students. By the census date, you know, two weeks later, I was down to 14. I dropped students who were inactive. A uh, couple weeks later, three weeks later, I was down to seven. Of those seven, only three took the final and passed the class. So my official success rate is three out of 14, 21%. Very discouraging. So I want to prepare you for that experience if that happens to you, especially in the STEM pathway, which is likely to take place. Part-time instructors are worried about their jobs and their evaluations, and we're trying to assure them that we're expecting success and retention to go down. Uh, it's going to happen. I did email the other 18 students who dropped or didn't pass the class and said, please take it again. Uh, I encourage you to do that. And even if, even if just one of them takes it again and passes, then four out of 14, I'll be at or above the state expectations <laughs> level, which is, uh, so I'll be good to go there. OK, so my bullets. Uh, how does teaching online differ from face-to-face? -face? Baby, it differs. When I created my first online class for the college in uh, 1999, I went through a big learning experience. There is a learning curve as you become, uh, as, as you learn how to teach online. For example, I put out a discussion board, told the students about it, invited them to participate, and said, have fun. Of course, nobody, nobody was there the whole semester. So you have to learn how to lure students to the discussion board using techniques like uh, uh, Victoria mentioned. Uh, it, it is different. I think the, the main difference is if you want to do a crappy job, it's really easy. It's really easy to set it and forget it. With state laws and mentoring and professional development, that's becoming harder and harder to do. The other difference is to do an outstanding job of teaching an online course is very, very difficult and time consuming. So those are the big differences. Uh, the second bullet is use of technology, and I want to tell you what transformed my life about about 12 years ago, I bought a tablet PC. I spent about $2,000. This is my third iteration. They last about six years. But uh, can you hold that up and un lift up the unfold the clamshell for me <laughs> and twist it around and fold it back down? And I recommend that you get a device like this that can open up multiple windows, that can multiple browsers, that you can copy and paste uh, screen captures from the internet, from your ebook into discussion board messages and your lectures. And, and I project this onto the big screen in the classroom when I teach on site. I gave up using whiteboards about 12 years ago. And I use this to lead meetings and webinars online and share my screen. I know three, two, three thousand dollars sounds like a lot of money, but this is your career, this is your, this is your lively, this is your passion. You invest the two or three thousand dollars over a six year period, it really doesn't cost that much. Uh, cell phone cameras and, and apps, you, you want to encourage students to take pictures of their work to share. You want to do screenshots of your graphing calculators. I have students take pictures with their cell phones of their graphing calculator screens and share that. There, there's, there's so much technology you can use that you should adopt. To increase instructor presence and engage students, I recommend that you check discussion boards as you begin your workday first. And if someone calls you, my voicemail outgoing announcement says thanks for calling me. Uh, Best way to reach me is by email. I check it every day. Or please post a message on the discussion board. It's the first thing I look at every day. That's the best and fastest way to get help in the class. If you want to leave a message, go ahead. I check my voicemail about once a month. Thank you. <laughs> or something like that. If someone emails you a question, my response is, that's a great question. Could you do me a favor? Other students may be wondering the same thing. Could you please post it on the discussion board so uh, I or another student will reply right away with help. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, what was I in? Uh, uh, the instructor, everybody was talking about a, a, a contact, ask your instructor question. I disable that. 
Uh, I don't want them to email me and answer the same thing 10 times. I want the discussion board to be the heart of the course. Uh, I mentioned about prioritizing and managing your time. The first thing I do is go on the discussion board every day. It's so exciting. It's like walking down the hall to your classroom. I wonder what questions they're going to be asking today. That's the same excitement I feel when I boot up my computer and visit the discussion board and I spend the, the first and largest part of my day right there. I embed pictures. I ha oh, one, one last thing, I do a triage. If the question is easy, I try and hold off for at least half a day or a day and hopefully a student will answer the question for them. Uh, if not, I'll jump in. The second thing, if it's a medium level difficulty question, I might give them a hint. Oh, you know, this problem is just like uh, example seven on page 185 of your textbook. Check it out. If you, if, that, if you need to, we can go further, let me know. And then for those really, really difficult questions, I'll go all out. I'll spend an hour posting my response. I'll do handwriting and scan it and then embed that. I'll take pictures of my graphing calculator screen. Uh, I'll, I'll make a two minute video because you, you, I don't do that very often, but the, do that triage. Our impulse as teachers is to answer every question and I don't recommend you always do that. You need, st students need to learn how to help each other. Uh, it's really good to answer questions with questions and uh, encourage that discussion. Thank That's you very five. much. That's five minutes. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. All right, it's your turn. Uh, we are ready now for questions, comments. We'll pass around the microphone here. Thank you, Logan. Um, lots of hands. Hope you can figure out who, who which one came up first. Mine probably didn't. Um, I just had a question about how you've handled resistance from uh, math instructors, because I've encountered a lot of that as a distance education facilitator. I teach English, and we're, we're fine, but trying wow, to. you're a brave woman. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying, we, I don't think we have any math classes online, and so we're trying to move forward with that, and I was just wondering how you've addressed that. What was the question? How do you, how do you, how do you deal with resistance? from math faculty. Or how do you get buy-in from the various yeah. people who need to buy in? From my perspective, I think it's an equity issue because it's access to all. So students that cannot come to campus, like Michael's story, I think that's the thing that drives it. And if you could start with one class and then let the instructors see how it's done, I think transparency is another important thing because like Fred said, you can make a class the bare bones and minimal contact, and the instruct a lot of the instructors that don't teach online at Citrus, I know they feel that we don't do as much work as they do, but that's not true if you're doing a really, you're trying your best to do a good job. Uh, was that a, uh, any other yes, tips yes, or ideas? Yes, yes. Fred. <laughs> what, you're getting a resource one the, here? One of the sessions yesterday, I'd like to share a, a screenshot. Um, First of all, I would never force a professor to teach online, just like I would never force a student to take an online course. But I don't know, maybe it's because we started early, but we have more instructors wanting to teach online than we have classes available to assign them. Uh, at Coastline, 85% of our math enrollment is purely online. If students want a traditional course, they may attend a sister college like Orange Coast or Golden West in the district. But I, I do know, uh, that students often are overwhelmed by an online course. They don't know how to manage their time or motivate themselves to, su to succeed in an online course. And you may, they may have one class where success is low. But the paradox, that's the title of this slide. The paradox is, put simply, at a national level, even potentially less prepared students who participated in distance education early in their college careers were more likely to attain a degree than students who had not done so. You are doing students a favor by encouraging them to learn how to learn online, how to communicate, how to collaborate online. It's a, it's a lifelong learning skill that you will be uh, doing them a favor to arm them with that, 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 that 21st century skill. And even though there may be an initial lack of success overall, Quote them this from a 2014 study by Shea and Bidgerano. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Next question. <coughs> no, I have a comment. Uh, okay, and then, and then I, you're next. 
uh, John Stalker. I'm an ed tech specialist at Merced, or they know me as the Canvas coach. You guys are awesome. What you're doing is just really, really awesome in your use of discussion boards. But I'm here to evangelize for Pronto. Okay, if folks have not gotten into Pronto, Pronto will do everything you want with your discussion boards quickly and easier. It's on the desktop and it's also on the mobile app. I have a chemistry professor who exclusively uses Pronto. This is the mobile app and these are the threads and the students can post pictures and questions and um, he's find that a lot of his qu the students are answering their own questions. So, you know, I think Pronto will accelerate it and you won't have to open your laptop. You can work right off your phone on Pronto. Okay. No. P-R-O-N-T-O, yeah, they're downstairs uh, as at the vendor booth. We're in the pilot program for Pronto. Uh, the faculty that are using it are uh, loving it. The kids are using it. It's, it's a native adoption because it's just like chat in Facebook. So yeah, you can LTI. Seriously good, uh, seriously good app. You can LTI the app into Canvas so it's yeah. resident on your course nav bar. Uh, Raise, yeah, the distinguished gray-haired individual. I have a couple of questions. One is for the group, the panelists, and the other is for you, Bob, actually. Uh, for the panelists, I noticed none of you talked about using Alex or any adaptive software. And I was sort of wondering why you, you hadn't chosen not to do that. And for Bob, I don't know if you went to Educause, but from Educause's point of view, a lot of the presenters were pushing uh, adaptive software for math, single courses developed by multiple faculty, supplemented with tutoring and videos that the faculty had made. And I'm kind of wondering, what your perspective is about that and whether you took part in any discussions with those people. It, it wasn't ASU online, this was just ASU in general. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of wondering about what your perspectives are about that. Okay. One of you like to take the first one? Um, I'll, I'll just say from, from an Alex perspective, it's strictly a cost standpoint. I don't want to incur, have my students pay for that. And additionally, I think with my open math that if you use that as as something for students to use, then um, you can continually make it better. You can always make it better, that it'll eventually become the perfect online system. It just depends on how much work the instructor wants to put into it and how integrated they want to be into it. So that's my main reason why I don't go down a route of Alex or anything like that. I feel like my open math can be the most effective thing because it has our voice and what we care about within the course as opposed to Alex is what McGraw Hill's textbook thinks is important rather than what what I think is important. Sarah, any more or that nodding heads? Everyone agrees. Um, regarding adaptive software, especially in math, it is very intriguing. We hear many of these homework platforms say they're adaptive, but they're not adaptive as I think you and I are thinking, where the software itself can can ca uh, capture the student's performance and then pose another question that is placed right in their proximal zone. Uh, if you know Vygotsky's theories about challenging them just enough but not too much, in theory, shortening the time to mastery. That's really adaptive software. And if it's OER, I am all for it. But I, I think free trumps that intriguing value for, for me. Did that answer that question? Um, I'm, I'm waiting for the free option. <laughs> and it's hard because that takes a lot of coding to really make it right. Okay. Next question. Hi, I have a question for the panel. And I attended, Fred, um, the Zoom session you did yesterday. But the nature of your courses in terms of interacting or getting the students to do student-to-student -student interaction because of the nature of math, what type of best practices would each of you do to do like group work or collaborative work where they're interacting in, in this type of um, subject matter? Group work beyond the discussion forum. Yes. In my on-campus class uh, for stats, I used to give a project where they'd have to actually survey uh, 100 people, create a list of questions, go through all of the different statistical techniques to support or not support their hypothesis. I'm going to start doing that in my online class because I can break it up by module. I can have Canvas create my groups because it can do that for you. You just tell it how many students you want in the group and it will tell you who's in each group. It's very nice. Um, another thing I learned yesterday about a best practice, so I'm stealing it from the session I went to, is that an instructor leaves a Zoom meeting open all the time. 
that just he creates it and then just it's open all the time. The link is posted for students so students can get together themselves in that Zoom meeting. So I thought that was pretty brilliant. Would it be okay if I shared the same story? I, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I often, as a professor, attend my own professional development webinars. I hear about one, and I sign up for it, and there's maybe, what, 25 or 50 or 75 others attending the webinar, right? And how engaged am I? About 20%, right? I've got my email open in one browser, Facebook in another, Twitter in another, my course website in another, and I kind of check in on the webinar and, and perk up when something interests me. Well, one day, the presenter said, okay, I'm gonna break you up into groups, and that little scrolling bar with everybody attending, and you could see their webcam uh, webcams disappeared, and poof, in the middle of the screen was me, large as a life. And then poof, to my left was this other male professor attending the webinar. And poof, to my right was another female attendee of the webinar, large as a life. And we could only talk to, hear, and see each other. Bam! Instant 100% engagement, right? And I, it was an epiphany for me. I realized the technology is now possible to remotely have a, you know, high engagement collaboration. So um, I, I was midway through the semester and I decided to incorporate that. We have a faculty member who's a part-timer at our school, full-time at another, who said he kind of does that in his webinar and he invited me to his home where he leads his meetings. And I drove out to his house one night and I, he fired up the meeting and started going over some math problems with students and discussing something and gave a little one or two minute lecture lesson. And then he gave them a problem to work on and he said, I'll be back in five minutes. He steps away from the desk and says to me, Fred, let's go have a glass of wine. <laughs> I said, yeah, I can get behind this. <laughs> so that was a way to replicate the the collaboration that I often do in the classroom, right? I lecture about 25% of the time. The other is all collaboration and group work while I wander around the room and, and lurk and, and listen and, and, and uh, change, you know, uh, collect, correct misconceptions and then have whole class discussions. And, I, and using software like Zoom, I was able to do that online. It is possible. My only difficulty is in those Zoom webinars, in those Zoom meetings, all they can do is talk. When I have students show their work on paper and pencil and hold it up to their webcam, it's a total blur. You can't read it. I, I, that's my, how, is anyone in the audience having meetings like this where, you, where students share their work on paper and pencil, or, you know, in writing, and if so, how do you do it? And Sarah behind you may have a comment. Yeah. Uh, what I do is I have a little $5 whiteboard from Target. Well, that's you. We as professors can share our work. I'm talking about students at their homes. Lottery funds can provide things, tangibles that the students use. Mm -hmm. And what do you mail it out to them? Hmm. <laughs> okay, what else? Um, so, so Proctorio is getting really popular on our campus, and um, as you as you've probably realized, when you don't use a web, it's not required to use a webcam with Proctorio, but when you stop using it, its effectiveness goes down a lot. Um, so, one way we've kind of helped um, help that issue is that for hybrid math courses, is we've worked with the labs on campus to provide computers with camera access. But how would you address that for online courses? Because uh, a lot of instructors have told us that they feel uncomfortable requiring their students to have a webcam, and they don't think proctorial is effective enough without the webcam to do secure exam proctoring. So how would you address that for fully online classes where students shouldn't be required to go anywhere to, to participate? Right, so um, doing the low stakes quiz uh, and proctoring that, I've come to realize that it's pretty easy to tell when a student is on their cell phone as compared to their calculator, even if you can't see it. So that's one thing, and, and also I feel like a student being filmed uh, in a problem that's essay response, critical thinking, and all of those things, I think it creates a high, high risk, low reward for the student. So I think that that, 
I feel like the strength of Proctorio is the fact that the student is being filmed and the fact that you know if somebody else comes in the picture, it alerts it, and the fact that you can hear sound. So if somebody's flipping through a notebook, you can hear that and you can see that, regardless of if the camera sees the desktop. So I feel pretty confident that it works, but it's totally dependent, and it's easy for me to say this in stats, that you just have to write like essay type response questions, that that's easy to do in stats, and I totally recognize that. I think it's a whole different ballgame for math, um, like an algebra course or calculus thing. But I, I feel pretty confident that the ID check, um, seeing if anybody else is in the room and the sound and all of that works pretty well. And I talked to a proctorio rep today, and uh, he suggested try setting the standard to where the computer is further back so that you can see the um, see the desk. And I think just the main key point here is, is write a question where looking on the phone isn't really going to help. That I think that minimizing outside resources, how is that going to help? Uh, and I think that's the most important thing, or the thing that I've focused on to kind of deal with those holes that Proctorio does have. Webcams are becoming more ubiquitous. Um, they're, they're, they're $20 now. And, and I haven't heard yet, but perhaps there's a creative use of equity funds that we could help some students who it truly is a, a financial burden. We, I think we have maybe two more questions. Time for two more. Hi. Um, I, th I think this is a follow-up question for you, Ma Michael, on Proctorio. Um, I'm Lisa Beach from Santa Rosa, and I'm a distance education coordinator and not a math professor. God bless you all. Um, but uh, one of the questions we get about Proctorio or trying to use Proctorio is, so you're filming the student, they're taking the exam, and as, as, I, I, as I've just seen the demonstrations, then uh, for the faculty member, they get that report that shows you know, whether it was, there might be a problem. Um, and then I guess as the professor, you maybe go look at the videos that are flagged as possibly being a problem. And the question is then what, right? So you, you see a, a video and you hear something that sounds like maybe a student's getting help, or you hear something that sounds like maybe it's pages flipping, or you see somebody that looks like they might be doing something. And so then you say to the student, what, you know, I think you cheated. And the student says, that was my mom, you know, in the background, or my roommate walked through the room or is studying next to me and flipping pages or, you know, and then do you have to have some kind of an argument with them about, I mean, I just wonder what then, right? How, do, how does that work? That's a really tough question. <laughs> and uh, I will say I had a student, I had two students that were using notes during an exam, and I just asked them, I said, were you using notes during the exam? And they said, yes, we thought it was open notes like the quiz, they didn't read the instructions. It was that quick. So I just think reaching out first and asking the student, um, but also uh, I feel like those things can happen in our on-ground classes too. Were you on your phone? How is that argument going to go? The difference is, is with Proctorio is that they're filmed doing that. Right? And in class, that's, not, that's up to, to whoever's interpretation of what happened. So it's even more of an argument in class. And I feel like Proctorio maybe is more, it, it holds a higher level of, of accountability because it is, on, it is filmed. So, and, and also, I think, to uh, the way I go through proctoring exams is all the high alarms I go and look at. And the rest of them, I just make sure that I see everybody's exam through eight times speed at one time. So you don't have to do it the day of the exam. You can do two exams a day or three exams a day. And that gets through there. Sure. And Fred wants to make a comment. So <laughs> we have 60 seconds. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. First, first of all, some of our online courses have 80 students. And I just think it's just impossible to, even at eight times speed, to scroll through those videos. Second of all, uh, at three points. Second of all, we had one of our instructors cheat on Proctorio through sleight of hand with the highest settings possible. He was able to cheat using his cell phone, and he filmed it all with a laptop camera set off to the side. Third, I would ask your students, challenge your students, say, uh, can you all tell me how you would cheat using Proctorio? <laughs> you will find so many ways you can cheat with Proctorio. Fourth, are, any, are you all members of AMATIC? Or a math, uh, go to AMATIC. We have a position paper on proctored testing and that it should be required. Human proctoring should be required. Authentic assessments that are open-ended and free response, explain your thinking and justify your answer, as Michael said, should be required for, for, for an uh, authentic assessment. So we're not using Proctorio. We're encouraging it for low-stakes quizzes 
or identity uh, confirmation, you know, the first week of class, and that, that's about it. All right, I have to stop it there, and, and Michael, <laughs> we are gonna continue this conversation in the community, but let me leave you with this. Whether you use human proctoring or not isn't up to the UC or the CSU, it's up to your curriculum committees to write that, your preferences, into your course outline of record in your DE addendum. It's up to you. All right, if you would, give us your names and email addresses if you want to be part of the community, and let's thank our panelists. All right.